Yeah. Kids, did any of you get candy yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the big kids got some too? All right. So did you bring some with you? Okay, well, make sure you come back later because there is going to be cake over there. And I know there's a lot of other goodies as well. All right, our children can go on to children's worship. And you're going with Suzanne. So... Today's your sister's birthday. You give her a big hug for us, okay? Is Grandpa going to be there? Oh, well. Well, you still, you tell her happy birthday for us, okay? Good. How many of you like a dare? <laughs> Most of you don't? I love dares. You know, just dare me, okay? Just dare me. Well, I want to dare you to do something today. I want to dare you to do something dangerous. I've, I've been asking Debbie this last week, okay, dear, which one? I want to either do hang gliding or I want to get that Harley. Which one is it? Well, if I see in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, both. <laughs> right? Both. Come on. Harley and the, and the hang gliding. I'm scared to death of heights, but, but it still seems like it'd be fun to be up there like that, right? Because at least you can hang on to something. And by the time you're out there over the edge, you're already over, right? So, but, so I, but I want to dare you to do something. I would say that probably one of the most significant spiritual times in my life came when I dared to pray a prayer that was really tough. And I want to dare you to pray this prayer. Lord, break me. Lord, break me. We can all have this view that things are fine between us and God. And we've got it pretty well together. You know, and looking around the room, you, you probably do. And it would be easy for you to say, you know, yeah, Lord, break that person next to me. I always have to be careful. Here we are on, you know, day after Valentine's, and, and it's always dangerous, you know, because sometimes spouses are doing, you know, you get the rib, rib breaking, right? It can be really painful, right? You know, yeah, you, yeah, you, you do need it, yeah. But, but no, no, no. You see, I, wanna, I really want to dare you and challenge you to, to pray this prayer. Lord, break me. And to see what God would do with a person who was so broken by him that they became fully devoted to him. Does sin ever bother you? And again, I'm not talking about the person next to you and their sin. But does your sin ever bother you? If, if any of you have a habitual sin, chew your fingernails. Oh, that's not a sin, right? Sorry. It, it, it's about a discipline issue, isn't it? Do any of you ever worry? Oh, that's not a sin. Do ever any of you cuss and use the Lord's name in ways that he would not appreciate? Oh, that's not a sin. It's just a slip of the tongue. It's a sin. Any of you ever... Watch movies that really aren't going to honor God and they're not really going to help you and they're probably not going to help your marriage either. Watch porn, read stories, uh, do things that... It's sin. And the habitual ones are the ones that kind of get to us in two ways. On one hand, oh, again, oh. And we get that kind of shame that comes. Or we have a worse view of it. Okay, that's just the way I am, forget it. And the sin 
is harming us deeply. And so I, I, I'm serious about this. I want to I I plead with you if I could today for you to begin praying this prayer. Lord, break me. And here's the wonderful thing that I know. We sang about it earlier, didn't we? We have a God who is gracious. Folks, literally, thank God for that. Because if he wasn't gracious, he would have just blown us all away decades, centuries ago, right? There's a, <laughs> there's a reason why Jesus hasn't come back yet. Because he doesn't want anyone to perish. He loves this world and he loves humans so much that he doesn't want anyone to die without him. And so sometimes people cry out, you know, God, get rid of evil. God, why do you allow this bad stuff to keep happening? Come on, God, end it all. And he's saying, you don't know how much it hurts me, but you also don't know how much I love. That The moment I end it, that's the dividing line. And I don't want anyone to perish on the other side of that line. So he's patient. Wow, tons more patient than most of us. And he waits. But, it, but through the journey of life, right, and through the journey of time, God has been working out an incredible plan for us. Today we're starting in the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to look at Mark and try to see about how, how Jesus worked with his followers what were the things that he did as he discipled them? We've actually, the, the series is really about making disciples. And Jesus, just before he heads up to heaven, as he ascends and he leaves this place, he talks to his disciples and he says to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And the disciples understood exactly what he meant. And most of us, don't. We don't. And why do I say we don't? Because most of us probably are not doing a very good job of doing it, of making other disciples. And notice what he said there. He said, you're going to baptize them. You're going to identify them with Jesus Christ. And you're going to teach them, oh, that word we love. We're going to teach them to obey. Don't you like that one? You really do love it when you want somebody else to obey you. <laughs> Come on. But the obeying part uh, for you, maybe we don't like that as well. <laughs> Teach them to obey. And he said, look, in order to help you do that, this is, the, this is the really cool thing. I'm with you always to the end of the age. I'm there for you. And I'm going to give you, because I have the authority, I'm going to give you authority, I'm going to give you the resources, I'm going to help you teach others how to do the things that I've commanded. Because I'm with you always. Well, folks, Mark has good news for us. Let's turn to Mark, the first chapter, if you've got your Bible with you. Uh, we're, we're going to read just verses 1 through 8 today. And, and then let's see what this good news is that, that Mark has. Incidentally, Mark, it, it's believed, you know... It, that Mark is probably that young kid who was following after Jesus the day he was going to be crucified. It says that this young, this young disciple followed after him basically with almost nothing on, right? <laughs> a few things wrapped around him, and he's following at a distance and chasing after Jesus and watching him as he's being arrested and taken and eventually crucified. That's John Mark. He's famous for a few other things, isn't he? He went out on a journey. In fact, it said that he's probably a relative of Barnabas's. And he went on the first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas and John Mark. And he cut the journey short, didn't he? Stories all told about how, how John Mark, I don't know, did he get afraid? Did he get homesick? Did he get hungry for mom's cooking? We don't know all the details of that, but he left. It was so disturbing to Paul that later he says, I don't want him with us. They're going on another trip, and I don't want him to go along. Forget it. Leave him at home. 
He's irresponsible. He's a dumb young kid. Just uh, leave him at home. Well, he probably didn't say it quite that way. But I think he had some pretty strong language. It was such a strong debate between him and Barnabas, the man who's known as the son of encouragement, that Barnabas says, fine, Paul. You take Silas. The two of you go that way. I'll take John, Mark, and the two of us will go this way. And God wins, actually, because now he's got two teams going out instead of just one. We also know from Scripture that later, Scripture will tell us that John Mark is such a delight to Paul, ha, huh, something changed, that he pleads for Mark to come to him because he's a blessing to him. History tells us that Mark was so close to Peter that he was Mar Peter's secretary. Secretary. His scribe. He's writing the things down. And so they come to, P to Mark, excuse me. Those other disciples are being killed off. And they come to Mark and they say, Mark, we need to get down the stuff that Peter shared with you. And then Mark is that account. What's interesting is you go through Mark, you will find that Matthew and Luke actually pick up on the details from Mark. Mark's a, that source for a lot of stuff. So Mark's a really interesting character. Now, chapter one. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John came, baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. Whoa. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Oh God, break us. Break us. Give us the ability to listen and hear what you're saying. Change in us the things that maybe we've ignored or the things we don't want to change. Make us into new people, God. Prepare us for you, Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. It's the gospel, Mark says. And he's writing to us the gospel, the euangelion. It's the good news is that as we, it's de de in defined. It says, in fact, Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 9 says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Verse 9, you who bring good news to Zion, you who euangelion, you who bring news of a king that is coming. Incidentally, it's a really interesting term that's used here, euangelion. It's not a Christian term, actually, but we've kind of made it that, right? Euangelion, what's that sound like? Evangelism. Good newsing people. The gospel is about the good news that a king has come. And, and incidentally, this same word is used in a writing that's actually found about the birth of one Caesar Augustus. The Romans and the Jews both recognized that euangelion was a word about good news. A king has just been born. Now, I think they're a little bit different, don't you? <laughs> Caesar, and that's why Jesus says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. I think they're a little bit different. But the point is, is that both the Jews and the Romans, the people of the day, understood this term in an incredible kind of way in a very positive kind of way. This is good news. A king has been born and he's come to us. And here's what Isaiah says, is that there's going to be one that's going to be out in the wilderness preparing the way for the king. My question that I want you to wrestle with this morning is, are you ready for the king? Are you ready? Are you ready for Jesus to come? Would you have been ready if you were alive back then?
<laughs> John says that there will be this one in the wilderness and he will prepare the way of the Lord. How did he do that? Well, Alan Carr, in his um, commentary, says, John the Baptist preached during a period when the Jewish religion had become nothing more than dead orthodoxy. Legalism and ritual ruled the day. The Jews were in desperate need of a spiritual revival. The Gentiles had given up on religion and viewed most religious beliefs as superstitious and foolish tales. Anything familiar there? Okay. Both groups needed just what John preached. Carr says, they needed the truth. What did John do? How did he do it? He simply called people to repentance. Now this is interesting. He had no videos. He had no YouTubes. He had no sound system or anything like that. He's, and he, actually, he's out in the desert. Who wants to go out to the desert? Now, certain times of the year, it's really pretty in the desert. But most of the time, the desert's a very hot place. Don't go to Death Valley in July. If you're going to go to Death Valley, it's a beautiful place, right? But go there in January. Not July, okay? unless you have lots of extra water and other resources. But you see, the desert is a tough place. And, and what got, and here's, we have estimates that say some 300,000 people went out and were baptized by John the Baptist. That's a few people. He made an impression, didn't he? How many of you would run to the desert to hear somebody say, repent, you sinners? I'm not sure that that'd be the most exciting place to go, would it? But what was it that, that, that John was doing? John was touching this nerve inside of the people. They knew that their religion wasn't doing it. They sure knew Rome wasn't accomplishing it. And they had this hunger that comes inside of a man or a woman. And it's a hunger to get away from sin, to get free. It's a hunger to live and to rejoice, to be, to be happy, to be at peace with self and others. And so John the Baptist preaches, repent, turn around, change your mind, recognize your sin, feel bad for it. And make a commitment to do something different. We'd really rather not talk negative. In fact, can't we just kind of love and accept everybody just the way they are? Do we really have to, do we have to really point out sin? I mean, do we even need to use that word anymore, Paul? You know, you're a little archaic, dude. Can't, you know, can't, come on. Get up with the times, you know, we're happy and everything goes and it's all okay and God still loves us. See, we're the people of grace, right? Wow. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Friends, I know that sometimes the way what we preach here is tough. It'd be a lot easier just to say, hey, yeah, do whatever you want to do. God still loves you. But if I did that, I wouldn't love you. I didn't watch my sons just go out and do whatever they wanted to do. I tried to teach them. And there were times I had to correct them. And encourage them. And all that done, how? With love. Paul says, you know, if you're going to preach the word, give it to them. Give it all to them. Be prepared, regardless of the season, to speak the truth to them. Yeah. And the truth does hurt at times, doesn't it? Jesus is like John the Baptist, isn't he? John calls them, come out here, repent. 
And then he dunks them in the water and cleans them up and says, now go live, right? Well, Jesus did the same thing. He calls us to repentance as well. Matthew 3, verse 8, produce fruit in keeping with what? Repentance. Matthew 3.10, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. All right. The one coming after me, he shall baptize with fire. Luke 5.32, I've not call, come to call the righteous. So if you're one of the righteous, whoopee, you're fine. But I've call, come to call sinners. To repentance. Yeah, Jesus and John had a very similar message, really, when it comes down to it, didn't they? Repent. What did Jesus do with the 12 when he sent them out? Well, in Mark 6, it says, verse 12, so they went out and they proclaimed that people should what? Are you getting the word yet? <laughs> repent. <laughs> they should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick, and they healed them. Folks, I don't think it's just the role of John the Baptist, nor is it just the role of Jesus. Well, welcome back, kids. Do you have candy? <laughs> just wondering. <laughs> We should call people to repentance. And, and why? Because we want to make them feel bad, right? No, think about this. Do you remember the stories in Luke 15? A woman loses her coin and she finds the coin. And what does she do? She has a party to celebrate the finding of the coin. And what does Jesus say as he describes that story? He says, just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who what? Come on. Repents. Then over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. He tells the story of a sheep that's lost. And the shepherd leaves 99 in the fold and goes out and finds one and brings them back. And he says, what should we do? We should celebrate because there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. He then goes on, he says, there's, just so I tell you, verse 10, there is joy before the angels of God for one sinner who repents. I think, therefore, then, if heaven celebrates and parties when somebody repents, that this might be a good thing for us to do, don't you? Yes. Yes. Jesus is calling us to repentance. Revelation chapter 2, verse 5. Folks, oh, this gets serious, doesn't it? In the book where he's preparing for the return of the, of the Son of God, Jesus speaks to the churches. And what does he say? Well, let me give you one of them. In chapter 2, verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. What do you think the next word is? Repent. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you. Good? I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Mark, I dare say we were close to losing the lampstand. He's talking to a fellowship of believers. He's talking to a church. And, and it's Jesus saying this. Go back and do what you did at first. Get back to that first love, that initial enthusiasm you had for God. Get there. Repent. Verse chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 3. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief in the night. And you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Those whom I love, verse 19, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. As 
Jesus gave his commission to the disciples. He says, go into all the world and we're supposed to preach the gospel. We're supposed to make disciples. We're supposed to do what? Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey. In Mark 1 verse 4 it says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Acts 2.38 Peter's standing in front of a crowd of people. It's the first sermon anointed by the Holy Spirit after Pentecost. Holy Spirit's come, filled them up. They're, they're like, what is going on here? They're not drunk. And then Peter's explaining that. And he gives this really short, powerful message. And he simply tells them, you realize that you guys crucified the Messiah. Yeah, you put him on a tree. You killed him. You did it. Now, they had a couple of options, didn't they? The first option is the one that a lot of us fall into too often. Denial. Not me. No, I didn't do that. Uh-uh. Fortunately, the Holy Spirit was present that day, and there was a lot of conviction going on, and that's not the way they responded. In fact, the word says that they were cut to the heart. They felt it here. Their hearts were moved by this fact because they understood, oh, no. This would be one of those moments it might be appropriate to say, oh my God, right? I crucified the Messiah. Cut to the heart, they cry out to Peter, what shall we do? And what is Peter's response? Uh, have you got the word yet? <laughs> Repent. <laughs> Repent. Turn, change direction. You're going the wrong way. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wow, that sounds a lot like John, doesn't it? Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. This is what God wants to give us. Forgive us, clean us, wash it away. And so what is baptism? Well, baptism's where you get clean, right? So we better do a lot of dunking every single week, right? Well, please, if you don't bathe once a week, Do it at least before you come. <laughs> Repent and be baptized. Folks, there's actually still water in here from the last baptism. And I guess if you really were desperate, we could baptize you even with this water. You wouldn't get dunked, but I could get, a li get you a little bit wet. But really, that's not about what's, what it's important about, is it? What's important is, is that baptism is an identification with Jesus Christ. Romans 6 says it. It's an identification with his death and his resurrection. That's why we place somebody underwater and bring them back up. Somebody pray right now that Bill doesn't get distracted because he could go on a couple of stories and he's not supposed to do that. Okay, so Y'all praying that quick? Thank you, thank you. Pent and be baptized. Identify with the death of Jesus Christ and identify with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you know what? You could do that with a cup of water too if you needed to, right? Look, here, this is the, the water. It's symbolic of the water, the cleansing. And just like you died in Christ, now look, you're risen in Christ too. So uh, folks, don't get hung up on the method. Okay, I know he's called John the Baptist, and this is the Baptist church, so I, I, don't worry, I'm still okay. But don't get hung up on the method. The point is the what? The obedience to what Jesus has said to do. Anyone can obey that. Anyone can take that step of saying, Lord, yeah, I've messed up. I've done wrong. I've blown it. I'm going down a path you didn't like, and I want to change. And I want the payment of your death for what I've done wrong so I can be set free by your forgiveness. Repent and be baptized. In fact, if you've never been baptized, I'd encourage you to do it. It's not the water that cleans you, but it's an act of obedience that Jesus says, if you'll declare me before people, then I will declare you before my Father in heaven. It's an act of obedience that any of us can do. And if you've never done it, see, baptism takes something else, doesn't it? It takes humility. In fact, it takes some trust too. 
You know, Le Le Leslie Dodge Taylor, when we baptized her, you know, I'm always concerned with getting people out. She says, hold me under the water. <laughs> you know, he he forgive you anyways. You really don't need hell down there. And I I'm not going to have them thinking I'm trying to drown you. <laughs> <laughs> Repent and be baptized. Identify with Jesus Christ, with his death, his resurrection, and then go out and live for him. Romans describes this whole image. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. Are you ready to live with him? Because notice what Jesus said. He didn't just say, when you get to heaven, then you're going to live with me. He said, I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. When? Now. now. Alan Carr said, you know, these people traveled some 20 miles on foot. When they arrived where John was, he treated them like they were Gentiles. Yeah, see, baptism, you didn't do that again as a Jew. No, you got baptized because you were a Gentile and you wanted to be cleaned and accepted in. Circumcision and a few other things too, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> <clears throat> Is it must have shaken them to their core. Here was this preacher telling them that they were no better than the Gentiles. When they were confronted with their sins, they saw their sins and they repented. When they did, what did God do? God forgave them. John came with a strange appearance. He came with a strong message. He was out of step with his times. But God was with him. God used John the Baptist in an amazing way to carry out a powerful ministry. Baptism, it's recorded in Acts 9, 19, isn't it? While Paulus was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, well, then what baptism did you receive? Well, John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Folks, Paul's not saying that the baptism of John was wrong. But what he's saying is, is that, look, there were people who were baptized before he actually said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Look. You must follow him. I must decrease. He must increase. And it won't be long until then, right after that, John will be, lose his head. And Jesus will be lifted up on a cross. The disciples who went out there and got baptized, did you, do you think they got baptized again? No, they didn't need to. Because the baptism that they had was a baptism of repentance for forgiveness. And then they realized that it was by the death of Jesus Christ that they had been forgiven. So they had tied it all together. But these guys that Paul meets here from Ephesus, interesting place, haven't realized yet that Jesus died for them. So they're still back at, well, we got repentance because we got, we got washed and we became Jews. No, no, you get repentance that leads to forgiveness because you've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ that sets you free. Well, <clears throat> I guess I should get to this one final couple points. Two things. One, John pointed to Jesus. Our job is to point people to Jesus. 
How are you doing? Are you willing to pray the prayer I asked you earlier? Lord, break me. So let's pray. God, sometimes we're afraid of being broken because, well, frankly, we're afraid of other people knowing where we've messed up. Sometimes we're just uncomfortable with it because we're too prideful. We're certain we're fine. So why do we even need to pray that prayer? Sometimes, God, we think, well, hey, we're a Christian, we've, we've been baptized, we've done all the good stuff, and, and we're counting on religion and not recognizing that there's something wrong that displeases you. So today I pray that we would be just honest with you and ourselves. We need you, Jesus. No one else can do this for us. No one else can surrender to you. No one else can, can submit to you for us. It's got to be each one of us individually on our own. Nothing we can do that earns us your forgiveness. It's simply about allowing ourselves to admit that we need you. And I pray that you'll help us, God. From the most mature and strongest Christian in this room, to the youngest and who <laughs> just knows that daddy's holding her. Lord God, break us. Break us.